Testing. Good afternoon. My name is Robert Bromley. I'm the chairman of the Senior Method Veterans Advisory Board. And I welcome everybody here to our annual Exercise Tiger service. Mayor Mitchell, Commissioner Post of Colors. Post of Colors. Post of Colors. All right. Now introduce the Reverend Father Michael Racine, pastor of the Holy Name of the Sacred Heart Church. Let us pray. As we gather this solemn day. To remember this day of Exercise Tiger. We remember countless servicemen who lost their lives. Let us very simply pause for a moment of silence in their remembrance. Loving God, years later we never forget the loss of our servicemen who gave their lives that day and those who continue to serve our country, both here in the States and abroad. We thank those who take part in this ceremony today, a reminder that we never forget. We particularly remember Private First Class Justin Kirby. Make us continued instruments of your peace in our community, our nation, in our world each day, and continue to, per to protect those who serve our country so proudly. Amen. Thank you, Father Racine. Please be seated. I'd like to call forward Cadet Sergeant Asley Lopez from the Griffith High School Junior ROTC for some words regarding exercise type. Thank you. 
Training exercises for the Normandy invasion, also known as Exercise Tiger, began in the Slatkin Sounds, England, starting on December 15, 1943. While training in Lime Bay, part of the English Channel southwest of England, on April 28, 1944, German torpedo boats, which had evaded patrols out of Cherbourg, France, attacked eight U.S. tank landing ships. USS LST-507 and USS LST-531 were sunk off Portland Hill, England, and USS LST-289 was damaged. This brief action resulted in 198 Navy sailors and 551 Army soldiers dead or missing. Exercise Tiger was one of the larger exercises that took place in April and May 1944. The exercise was to last from 22 April until 30 April 1944 and covered all aspects of the invasion, culminating in a beach landing at Slapton Sands. Nine large tank landing ships, LSTs, on board 30,000 troops to include the United States 7th Corps, prepared for their mock landing, which also included a live firing exercise. The men of the convoy, including the 4th Infantry Division's Combat Ready Engineers, were afforded only two escorts. Of the two ships assigned to protect the convoy, only one was present. HMS Azalea, a corvette, was leading the LSTs in a straight line, a formation that later drew criticism since it presented an easy target to be used. The second ship that was supposed to be present, HMS Scimitar, a World War I destroyer had been in a collision with an LST, suffered structural damage, and left the convoy to be repaired at Plymouth. Because the LSTs and British naval headquarters were operating on different frequencies, the American forces did not know this. British counterparts had been briefed about the dangers from German e-boats. Armed with guns and torpedoes, these vessels were some of the fastest available and demanded constant vigilance and responsive action. Both would be harder to affect now that the convoy had only one escort. And then, shortly after, 0130 men on several of the LSTs caught sight of green tracers and heard approaching gunfire. The bridge crew of the LST, soon to be under attack, sounded General Hort at headquarters, but it was too late. The German evil torpedoes hit three LSTs, causing two to sink and a badly damaged one to limp to shore. Many servicemen drowned or died of hypothermia in the cold sea while waiting to be rescued. Many had not been shown how to put on their life belt correctly and placed it around their waist, the only available spot because of their large backpacks. In some cases, this meant that when they jumped into the water, the weight of their combat packs flipped them upside down, dragging them underwater and drowning them. The final tally included 198 sailors and 551 soldiers dead, making it the costly, costliest training incident since World War II. But after the disaster, several changes resulted from mistakes made in Exercise Tiger. One, radio frequencies were standardized. The British escort vessels were late and out of position due to radio problems, and a signal about the EVO's presence was not picked up by the LSTs. Two, Better life jacket training was provided for landing troops. And three, plans were made for small craft to pick up floating survivors on D-Day. Allied commanders and their advisors recognized the unique vulnerability of LSTs to evil attacks and planned accordingly. They eventually landed on the decision to eliminate Germany's evil force in the channel. General Dwight D. Eisenhower's staff at the Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force organized a sea and air war against the EVOs, which finally bore fruit on 14 June 1944 D-Day. Thank you, Ashley. The Veterans Advisory Board took on uh, handling of the annual exercise tiger service back in 2010. In 1987, the first memorial was placed in the city on Park Street in front of the Andrews Day Hill VFW Post. And in 2007, the veterans from that post, as well as the veterans that had made up the Exercise Tiger Association, 
petitioned the city to move the memorial down here to the city, uh, down here to the museum. Along with that, they asked the museum to take on the role of caretaker for any of the items that they had, uh, particularly two, two important items that we have up front here. A piece of shale that actually came from Slap and Sand, and one of the only battle flags that are in the city uh, from World War II. And this is the only surviving battle flag from Exercise Tiger that was taken off an LST while it was on fire and rescued. And over the years, the veterans that had these items started bringing them to the museum as the caretaker. In 2010, the veterans realized that they could no longer handle uh, the service and requested that the, associate, the Veterans Advisory Board take on the annual duty of preserving their memory. So between the two organizations, this is what we do every year. With that, I'd like to bring up Peter Clark, U.S. Army veteran, veteran of uh, OAF, uh, and I have him as our chairman of the annual exercise Tiger Day service. Thank you, Bob. Good afternoon, Mayor Mitchell, Colonel Napoli, Colonel Bethany, City Councilors Morad Gomes, Markey, State Representative Tony Cabral, Ms. New Bedford. Uh, thank you for all attending. Uh, Councilor Naomi Carney, I see you're back there. How are you? Thank you all for coming uh, to commemorate the Exercise Tiger Memorial that we have here today. Uh, we are especially honored to have the New Bedford High School Reserve Officer Training Corps here, the first and the oldest training uh, ROTC in the nation. And uh, that's pretty exciting that we have the cadets here to learn some history of Exercise Tiger and military history and to provide some community leadership. Uh, so we're super thankful that you showed up and Colonel, you've done a great job with the cadets, so we appreciate uh, their efforts here today. Thank you very much. When I actually, when I look at the cadets, I see a couple things. I see courage and I see leadership. And I think that's very important in the youth uh, that they're engaged in this activity. Uh, there are many clubs that you can join uh, when you're in high school, and I think this one is a club, it's more than a club actually, it's a, it's a lifelong leadership opportunity and they're on the right path as young adults uh, leading their peers uh, in this endeavor. So again, you're on the right track and we appreciate you, you look sharp and we're very excited to work with you as a Veterans Advisory Board in the future. Uh, the Veterans Advisory Board, we're tasked to assist the mayor and preserving memorials, uh, the Memorial Day Parade and the Veterans Day Parade. And we, we work closely with the mayor and he has given us uh, a tremendous amount of leadership not only through the city for what he does for the residents but also for the veteran community. He is a leader, he takes charge and we're lucky to work for him. And there is a project that has been ongoing for a couple years uh, and it's a big one and the mayor and this is a really big one for the veteran community as well as the citizens is that the mayor has authorized the city to conduct a global war on terror memorial uh, and that is a special uh, memorial because that war took over 20 years and it involved a lot of people you know in one way or another we are all connected to the global war on terror we knew somebody we served we were affected in many ways. So the Veterans Advisory Board and the community, we want to thank you, Mayor, for authorizing uh, this memorial to be built. We're looking forward to it. And please be on the lookout for some community information that will become available because we want this memorial to uh, represent the, you know, the veterans, but also have input from the city residents. So we ask that you be on the lookout for community engagement activities that will happen in the next, you know, the next couple months. So we're excited for that and we look forward to your participation in that. All right, so we appreciate that. So uh, the current members of the board that we have 
Uh, we have our chairman, Mr. Robert Bromley. Uh, we have our secretary, the veteran service director, Mr. Christopher Gomes. We have Army veteran Paul Souza, myself. Uh, we have Karen Cosme, a Vietnam veteran Bruce Stewart. We have veteran Dan Goulart, and Alicia Duff is going to be a new member that is going to be added. Alicia is in the process of being confirmed uh, as a member of the board, and she has a background in military intelligence, so I'm glad that we'll have some intelligence coming on to the board, so that's exciting for us. Uh, so right now, I'd like to take the opportunity. I appreciate you coming here. We're thankful to serve on this board. Uh, if you just look around the room, you know, the United States, you know, military is a huge part of the success of this country. And we all have some, we all have given something to this country. And as a veteran, it is a, it's a great opportunity to serve the community on this board. And I really enjoy working with the mayor, the mayor's office, uh, Chris in his office, and the other veterans, especially the veterans uh, of the military museum. If you just look around, they have a lot of information here, so they have to manage this whole space, and they were courteous enough to allow us to occupy this space for this event. So it's like a great partnership that we have uh, with the museum. We work uh, closely together, so if you see a um, military museum volunteer, shake their hand, tell them thank you, and if you have any information, a story you wanna share, uh, reach out to them. They'd be happy to share it along uh, in the museum in the future. Uh, so with that being said, I'd like to introduce uh, the Veteran Service Director of the City of New Bedford, uh, retired Sergeant Christopher Gomes, Operation Iraqi Freedom Veteran. for coming out. Uh, this is one event that we do out of many in the city uh, that I think is special. It's something uh, where we get to recognize the veterans during in a horribly tragic training accident. Um, we all that have served, we go do what we're told to do, and most of the time there's no intent behind it. And that's because of all the training we do. You know, we may train a hundred times for something that takes place one time, and hopefully we never have to do it again. But sometimes during those training, opportunities, accidents happen for unknown reasons. Um, and sometimes, you know, they can be not as serious all the way to veterans passing away uh, during them. The important part to that is that we learn from those training accidents. So they bring everybody forward uh, into new ways of doing things. Uh, I myself, I lost my leg in Iraq. We trained over and over and over again for convoys and getting hit with IEDs. I am here because of all the training we did, and I'm here because of the people who didn't make it, uh, because we, we didn't have the knowledge we did when they were hit. Um, so I just want to sit here and say that, you know, I, I enjoy these events. This is a special one for us. I want to thank uh, PFC Kirby's family for being here. Um, it's, I was there when he was coming home as part of putting that together. I, worked with uh, Mayor Mitchell to make sure that we were gonna have everything the way it should have been done through COVID. Um, but that's just gonna calm down. Uh, I just wanna thank everybody for coming. Some things hit me a little harder than others and I just, uh, just wanna thank everybody for coming. Uh, I hope everybody takes a look around the museum. Uh, everything here is all local. Uh -huh. this, this is the guys of New Bedford and New Bedford. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I'd like to call forward now uh, the mayor of the city of Bedford, John Mitchell, for mayoral remarks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Bob, and uh, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, I just uh, want to 
thank the folks who put this together today. And it starts with the Veterans Advisory Board, Bob and Chris and Pete, the entire board, Bruce, uh, all of you who have um, who work hard all year long to, uh, to exalt the service of those who uh, came before us uh, in demonstration of uh, the reverence they deserve, but also the reverence that future generation who might serve need to know. Um, so thank you guys for, for the work that, that you put into it. I want to thank the board of the museum uh, for, again, for your devotion all the time. Every time I come back, there's something, there's something new uh, here to, to look at. It's one of these places, as everyone who's been here knows, we walk around and they say, geez, I hadn't seen that, I didn't know that. I, um, you learn something, but you also say, well, I know somebody who knows, that's somebody's relative, that's somebody's grandfather, that's somebody I know, right? Um, and that's a pretty cool thing, and it's really become a big part of our city's history, uh, our uh, repository of our city's history. Um, I want to thank and welcome, of course, uh, Colonels Bethany and Napoli for, for being here today, all that you do uh, to uh, promote military service and to, uh, to give back, as you have, each of you have done uh, time and time again. And I want to thank my good friend Father Racine for always being there for veterans as he is uh, today. I, I, had, I, I just wanted to say I have a couple of comments to make. Um, and um, to, to, two things, and it, 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 just forgive me because you know, they're maybe a little bit unrelated. And then I want to talk about, um, about the, this event itself. So I, I, Pete, I, I, I think it's great. I wasn't going to say anything about the, the new monument, um, but the new monument um, is, is going to be fantastic. And I know a lot of the folks who are here today have been working on it. And you know, the goal there is that you know, New Bedford should have a monument to those who served in the global war on terror, as so many have. Um, so many, there are so many post 9-11 uh, veterans in the city and in Brady New Bedford and, and we, I feel very strongly that what we do in New Bedford has to be for them has to be first rate and that's what we're going to do and it is going to require, uh, we're looking at sites on the other side of the peninsula on the, on the west side um, and, and Pete is right, he is spot on, we're going to need everybody to contribute in some way however you can. Some people can afford to write checks. If you can, that's great. We will be sure to hit you up, right, Pete? Um, but there are other ways. It's spreading the word about it, letting people know that this is, um, this, this is a really important thing for all of us uh, to do. And I know there's a lot of folks in this room who have been involved in it. There's more to come. It's, it's moving along. It's going to be uh, a reverent reminder of the service uh, that so many uh, gave after 9-11. The second thing I just want to say again is forgive me, we're in a, in a temple of uh, New Bedford's military history and I can't help but uh, pass along if you haven't seen it because I know so many of you here are, are interested as I am in this thing, but uh, what was what just happened at Arlington National Cemetery this week, Chris Cohen passed this along to me. I wasn't aware of it, I suspect a lot of other people weren't, but there was a, um, a Union Cavalry Officer, the remains of a Union Cavalry officer named Isaac Hart, who is a New Bedford native related to rest some 110 years after his, uh, his death. And he uh, distinguished himself at, at, uh, at battles in the campaign to capture Petersburg in, uh, in 1864 and led uh, all black units. He was a white man who led all black uh, units. There should be made a, a movie after after him, and there's a long story about how his remains came, uh, came to be known to Arlington, but that was just two days ago, uh, down in Arlington National Cemetery, New Bedford native, and we posted about it, so I, I encourage everybody to stay off of Facebook, except for this, just to take a look, uh, <laughs> take a look at it, because I think you know, those of you who, who um, you know, have a, a reverence, as I know probably everybody in this room does for New Bedford's military history might be interested in it. Um, and then there's, uh, I, I do want to say a couple things about operate, about this ceremony because uh, Chris is absolutely right, it is a special one. 
it's special in lots of ways, not the least of which is that it, it it's came to be because of folks in New Bedford said this this has to be done. This is, it is some, at some level unjust that the soldiers and sailors who were lost as part of the training exercise, as exercise tiger, uh, known as exercise tiger in 19, uh, 1944, were uh, not given their, their due. And, uh, and so we have this ceremony every year. We have the ceremony, we have, uh, we've taken, we, the royal we in New Bedford, have made it so that those who are lost uh, are, are remembered. Their families know that they were remembered. And it's per it was perfectly understandable at the time that the matter wasn't discussed. That a yeah. military ne necessity, it made sense that not a whole lot of news was, was made of it and, and the information was suppressed. We get that. Um, but in the years ahead, it was the, the, when the, uh, the, the closing of the war, um, it, it had their, what they did had to be brought back to life. They didn't get the parade. They didn't get uh, to be the glory of serving their country um, in a, a time of maximum peril. And so folks in New Bedford made sure that that right was, was wrong, that, that wrong was righted, excuse me. Um, so for that, we are just really grateful. And it, to, to my mind, it's, it's, it's really a reflection of our city's values. Um, and and that's that you know, I know everybody who serves on our Veterans Advisory Board, everybody who's here today feel the same way. It's it's just that this New Bedford that this ceremony is a reflection of just how special New Bedford is too. Um, and it's especially poignant today. Um, this was a training exercise and we take the time uh, today to uh, remember Justin Kirby, uh, who himself passed away three years ago in a in a training exercise, an army training exercise out on the west coast. And he's from a, a family that has long served his father. Bob Kirby is with us here today. And as Chris noted, um, um, we worked very hard to do the best we could for um, uh, to remember him and pay, uh, pay tribute and honor, honor him. But this was just right at the start of the pandemic. And so it was, it was, it wasn't the full honoring that we, under other circumstances, that we would have liked to have seen. So, Bob, we're just really uh, pleased that we could do this for your family. And uh, we, um, we are grateful, obviously, for Justin's service, but we're also very proud of him and proud of the service that your family has, has given to our city and to our country over the years. Um, it also, and I'll just to close with this last thing, because if Peter brought up, um, the uh, JRTC, a great program at New Bedford High that Colonel Bethany, Bethany so ably manages and that Colonel Napoli used to as well. And it's such an impressive program. Um, it is a leadership training ground, of course. And I would just say to all of you who are in it, um, it's when you're, you're not taking the easy route through high school. And that's pretty cool. And you know, we're here today honoring folks you know, who weren't remembered well enough uh, by, by history, didn't get their, their due, but we're back here honoring them because that's the right thing to do because we want everybody to know that what they did mattered and what you're doing matters. And it's an especially timely thing these days because as I think a lot of folks know, it's, it's, it's hard to convince the youngest generation, I'm gonna sound old now, to, to sign up. Uh, the Army had its worst recruiting year last year in the last 50 years. That's, that's a little sobering, and there are lots of reasons for it, but it's not something that we should take lightly. And, and so, really, the, the, our work in letting everybody know what they did back in 1944 uh, is, a, is also about the future. It's about letting future generations know uh, and to understand and appreciate that um, our freedoms are, don't automatically happen. They're not free, of course, as the saying goes, but it just, it, it takes constant work and constant and everlasting devotion to I, the ideals uh, that underlie our republic and our American way of life. And, uh, and the example that you're all setting is exactly what we adults would, would hope for.
before, and so we just want it to become contagious among your peers. Um, so thank you for that today. Thank you for participating in the service, and I just want to thank everybody for showing up today because showing up is really important. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. At this time, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Colonel Stephen Bethany, United States Army, 32 years service, 10 years service with our high school JR OCC. Colonel. Thank you to all, and uh, thank you for inviting me tonight. Um, the thing I do want to stress is that it is the oldest. It is the oldest continuing, started in 1881. It was a program that a group of students and teachers came together and said, why don't we institute this military training with the education? So it started long before JROTC was, was even in existence. And it continued on. And a program like this doesn't continue for so long without the support of city officials, school administration, and the teachers and the uh, New Bedford itself, the city. So that's a lot to be proud of. I'm proud that I'm now part of that thing. In 1916, the National Defense Act was enacted, creating ROTC and junior ROTC. At that point, federal funding came into the city to run these programs. And at that time, it was changed from the Corps of Cadets to the program you have now, the JROTC. But the real stars of the program are the students. Right now, on the average, between the years, we get 250 <coughs> to 300 students <coughs> through our program. And all those students aren't going to the military. Our program is not geared to tell all the students, hey, this is where you want to go, you want to do the military. It's all inclusive. For those that want to join the military, for those that want to go on to college, we teach them and our mission states to become better citizens. And by doing that, we help develop their personal skills. Personal skills that are lacking even more today due to technology and phones when people are right across from each other and they're texting and they're not talking to each other. Well, that's what we do. And I'm going to give you an example, and she's probably going to hate me for this, but Aisley, who was up here reading that, when I asked her to read this and say, I want you to read it on Saturday, she looked at me completely petrified. <laughs> and was scared, I don't want to do it, I don't want to do it. And so, with a little bit of coaxing, she was up here and she did a great job. But that's what the program is about, to develop those skills, to get them out of their comfort zone and let them grow. Why? Because with those personal skills, they go out into the communities, into the military, to college, with those skills that most employers, if you pull them today, are lacking in today's employees. So that's what the program is. To develop those personal skills, all inclusive, as well as to make them better citizens. And that's it. Thank you. Before we begin our honors section of the program, I do want to recognize both the City Council President Linda Morad and Representative, State Representative uh, Tony Cabral. I don't know if either one of you would like to say a couple of words before we begin. It's a learning experience. We always, every time I visit this place, I come through this place, I learn something that I didn't, didn't know. And today, again, I learned that, uh, how wonderful it is that a resident of the city of New Bedford, uh, buried in Arlington Cemetery, it's incredible. We always talk about the 54th Regiment. Well, 
here it is, a resident of New Bedford, leading an old black company uh, out of New Bedford. And we also recruited uh, the 54th Regiment, uh, also recruited members of this community in New Bedford, so that's wonderful. But I want to thank all of you for being here today and really remembering an exercise tiger, how important it is and how important their mission was uh, to the success eventually of, uh, of D-Day. Uh, we don't, we don't, we came to know um, in New Bedford and across the ocean, in England obviously how important it is. The, that particular exercise was an unfortunate that so many of them passed away, died during that exercise. But I think it's important for us to remember. And we know in the city of New Bedford, we remember, we know how to remember the sacrifices of those who have served. And it's important that all of you are here paying honor and homage to, to all the young people. In those days, they were young, right? Um, and sometimes we can be critical of young people, but young people are really those who make up the military. And they step up and they answer the call every time. And we are one of the number one communities in this country that actually our, our young people know how to answer that call. So we are proud of that. On behalf of uh, those that I have the privilege and the honor of representing the good folks of the 13th Bristol, the residents of New Bedford, uh, if they all could be here, if they all could fit in this room, they would be here, but they are here in spirit. I can tell you that. I have great respect, uh, and they have great respect uh, for for this particular event and all the other events in this in this city around honoring those who served in the military. So, thank you very much. Thank you for allowing me to say a couple words. Um, my colleagues and I, Council Gomes, Council Carney, and Council Markey, are honored to be part of this service today. I just, um, many people have said the appropriate words. I just want to thank all of those that are responsible for this ceremony. We haven't had this for the last couple of years, and I know that myself and my colleagues have missed this service and many of the other veteran services that we always had in the city of New Bedford. And because of COVID, we had to pause. We look forward to continuing those uh, again as we, as we now recover from that pandemic. And to the members of the advisory board and to the volunteers here at the Military Museum, uh, thank you. Thank you for continuing to move uh, forward with making sure that those that have served us and have uh, left us in the past and those that are still with us are honored and thanked for what they have done, they and their families, for the freedoms that we have here in our country. And last but not least, to the young people, I'm always thankful that you're here. It's not just leadership. It's not just commitment. It's, uh, it's just watching you grow that uh, warms my heart. And it's wonderful to see uh, soon-to-be incoming Superintendent O'Leary here to support the young students of New Bedford High School. Thank you all for this opportunity today, and I look forward to the rest of the service. God bless you all. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Sigrid. Uh, we now will begin our honors program. Uh, in years past, we've had many of the surviving veterans uh, participate with us. And unfortunately, the last local veteran of Exercise Tiger uh, passed away in 2019, shortly before we had the last service before today. Uh, we do have some family members of uh, deceased veterans and survivors of Exercise Tiger with us, between Mr. Souza, who's sitting in row three back there, who has been with us every single year. on the honors program. Ladies and gentlemen, let us take a moment to remember our fallen brethren in the greater New Bedford area that paid the ultimate sacrifice in Operation Enduring Freedom and Iraqi Freedom. Uh, Sergeant Joseph Camara, United States Army from New Bedford. Lance Corporal Michael Ford, United States Marine Corps, New Bedford. Lieutenant Corporal Patrick Gallagher for Haven, United States Marine Corps. 
Petty Officer Second Class, Tyler Trahan, Freetown, Massachusetts, United States Navy. <laughs> Specialist Peter Enos, United States Army, Dartmouth. Past members of the Veterans Advisory Board who have uh, died in the, in the last several years. Mr. William Moran, U.S. Navy, World War II. Mr. Oliver Ali Moreau, USN, World War II. Mr. Louis Ferreira, U.S. Army, World War II. Mr. Howie Prescott, U.S. Army, Korea. Mr. Norman Danny Nadu, U.S. Navy, Korean Era. Colonel Grace Regan, United States Air Force, Vietnam Era. The families of the late exercise Tiger survivors. Family of the late machinist mate, first class Vincent Riccardi, age 54. The Sousa family of the late Petty Officer Third Class Louis Sousa, LST 511. The Williams family of the late pharmacist mate, first class William O'Connor, LST 54. The Doro family of the late Sergeant Winfred Doro, LST 507. And the family of John Billy Brumfield, KIA LST 507. <coughs> At this time, uh, <coughs> At this time, uh, Peter will be gathering uh, some of the uh, dignitaries and the families to go across the street. Before we proceed, I'm calling forward again uh, Mr. Tori Keels, uh, Mr. Griffin, for America the Beautiful. to say a few words on uh, behalf of Private First Class Justin Kirby. Uh, I had the honor to meet Justin in 2018 while working on the fire department. I was in the downtown area with my crew and I was approached by a young man. He came up to us and said, he introduced himself, he said, my name is Justin, do you know my father, Bob? I said, Bob who? He goes, Bob Kirby. I said, absolutely, I know Bob. I've served many fires with Bob. We have a good relationship. And I, right away, I was impressed with Justin because he told me that he had hopes of joining the fire department. And before I could get the words out of my mouth, he had a plan already in action. He was currently enrolled in fire services at Bristol Community College, which he graduated with honors. And he also became an EMT. While he was in training, he finished all these things, and he, he had a path already established for himself to join the fire department after he served his country. And the military occupational specialty that he chose was a 54 Bravo, and a 54 Bravo is a nuclear, biological, and chemical specialist. A very technical MOS that uh, you have to identify hazardous chemicals, use sophisticated equipment, and train a lot of people into identifying those and being safe around those. So I would ask Bob during change of shifts, I'd say, hey Bob, how's uh, Justin doing? And he'd tell me, oh, 
Justin was freezing cold and he has some blisters on his feet and he walked a bunch of miles and he's really sore and he's tired and he's hungry. And I was super excited about that. I said, that's fantastic <laughs> because he's a soldier. And he, he, he was a soldier. I could tell. I was impressed from the moment I met him. So he finished at Fort Leonardwood, uh, yeah, Fort Leonardwood, Missouri. Uh, and then he went to his advanced individual training. And he completed that 54 Bravo course, Nuclear, Biological, and Chemical Specialist. And that would have been such a great MOS for him to have in joining the fire department because that is a hazard where around, you know, dangerous chemicals. So it would have been a natural fit to have somebody with that skill set on the fire department. When he finished uh, his advanced individual training, he went down to Fort Benning, Georgia in June very hot in Georgia, and he took, he took uh, part in Ranger Assessment and Selection Program. And many of you may have heard, you hear the term Ranger, uh, and I'm here to tell you that is an absolutely very difficult training program to want not only attend to finish and to complete. And Justin went through that program and excelled. And again, I would, his father Bob would tell me of all the bumps and bruises and how difficult it was. So once he finished that training, he went to his assignment at Fort uh, Irwin, California, home of the National Training Center. And at the National Training Center, uh, for those that you don't know, that's an area in the Mojave Desert in the San, Ber San Bernardino County. And that is a large desert-like environment in which many of the armored units from across uh, the country, National Guard and Reserve units, and the Brotherhood of Tankers know that area well. Uh, that's a large area where military, large complex military maneuvers take place there. And Justin was assigned to the, uh, the headquarters regiment uh, of the 11th Armored, armored Cavalry Regiment, the 11th ACR, and what they do the 11th ACR, is they act as the opposing force, the op four. Uh, they play the bad guys, all right? So they are specially trained. They're constantly on the initiative. They're probing, they're conducting attacks against the large scale uh, army units that are preparing for combat. And they go in there and I can tell you that an opposing force soldier, they walk around with a little chip on their shoulder they walk around like they're, they're big and bad, they're, they're tough guys, so I can only imagine uh, Justin walking around, feeling you know, proud, being in Op 4, uh, you know, having a little swag to him, uh, and, and that's pretty cool. But not only uh, was, he, was, he a, was he an opposing force soldier, but he also has a 54 Bravo, an NBC specialist, he operates in a, a very small team. He probably has a senior NCO that he works with and himself, and they're responsible for teaching the other soldiers from the armored units how to prepare themselves and protect themselves from nuclear, biological, and chemical uh, attacks and training. So in his short time in the military, he was able to successfully do that. And, uh, it's an unfortunate situation that uh, while preparing soldiers to go to combat, uh, Justin uh, tragically lost his life in this vehicle accident. Uh, so we're honored that the family here, uh, his father Bob, his mom Patricia are here uh, today to present uh, the memorial wreath. So what we're gonna ask you all to do now is that we'd like for all the visitors to please gather around uh, at the uh, memorial outside uh, so we can have the family and the honor guard do a proper uh, reef displaying uh, exercise there. So if anyone needs assistance, feel free to stay here. Uh, that do great. But I do have uh, just one more announcement to make that uh, we do have an honored guest here uh, today. This is retired Lieutenant Colonel Joseph Napoli. Uh, and I know he was the one that actually uh, introduced and gave uh, the Veterans Advisory Board the idea to have the New Bedford High 
Reserve Junior Officer Training Corps to be present at uh, at these events. So I'd like to present to the, the Colonel. Colonel, you can stay seated. Is that uh, a couple of years ago we had the Colonel uh, as a Grand Marshal Grand Marshal of the Memorial Day Parade, and uh, here we have a very nice photo of the Colonel leading the charge, uh, leading the uh, high school JRTC cadets here at the at the memorial uh, on Memorial Day. So Bob is going to give that to uh, Colonel. <laughs> So ladies and gentlemen, please, uh, if you Thank could you. be so kind and make your way out to the memorial. Uh, the Kirby family, uh, Father Racine, uh, we ask you to remain behind in the color guard and we'll prepare. So thank you.